Ooh, participant counts going up quick. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. Come on in, everybody. We're expecting quite a large number. Well, we're never really sure how many will end up coming. So, um, but come on in. It's kind of one of those come on in and find your seat, and we'll start momentarily. Okay. So, everything seems to be working. So, I, I'm happy that the technology is working. Yeah. Me too. It's always a relief. That's that's a lot of pressure. Okay, so how are my numbers doing? Let's see. Oh, we're gonna turn all of the bells and whistles off so that those go away. All right, so it is, oh, it's bang on top of the hour. It's four o'clock for me here on the West Coast and it's seven o'clock in um, the east, Eastern Canada. And uh, well, I guess the Eastern time zone and <laughs> if you're joining us from the far east of, of the country, it will be an hour later at eight o'clock. Uh, I think we will get started. So um, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I'm the Dean of Student Success at York Bay University of the Toronto Film School. And on behalf of the student success team, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's or tonight's Ask an Expert session. Uh, this is our newly launched Ask an Expert. If you've been a regular attendee, we've done this in a, in a myriad of different ways over the last 18 months. And now we're doing this uh, one to, to two times a month on a really special topic. Um, welcoming uh, a really special expert each time. So I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to have you all here. Um, as we begin, however, I would like to acknowledge that the land York Bay University operates on in British Columbia, where I am personally located, is the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Kakai and the Kwikwetlam First Nations. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. So since 2003, September the 10th has been observed as World Suicide Prevention Day, and this year's theme is Creating Hope Through Action. In recognition of this global event, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Erga, who will lead today's discussion. Uh, by speaking openly about suicide, we can each play a role in promoting understanding, ending the stigma, and enhancing support. So Dr. Erga is um, adjunct faculty with York University's Masters of Arts in Health and Psychology program, having joined YU in 2016, same year I joined, so that was pretty oh. interesting. <laughs> um, she received her PhD in clinical psychology from Rutgers University, which is in New Jersey, in the US, and completed her internship at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, a recipient of a pre-doctoral fellowship awarded by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcohol alcoholism. Dr. Erga has extensive research training, clinical experience in the fields of prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. So in chatting about this session, um, we, uh, Dr. Erga has planned some places to pause to uh, welcome questions and we will also have time at the end. So if you are joining us on Zoom, uh, please feel free to use the chat feature. I've left that enabled for tonight's session and you can also use the Q&A panel. I will um, uh, break in as I can very respectfully to to put some questions uh, to Dr. Erka to Dr. Erga. We're going to talk, um, I think, first of all, about some data, including the recent research findings regarding the impact of the pandemic on suicide rates. So very, very timely. Then we'll have a bit of a pause and then risk factors, warning signs and protective factors. But really, please don't hesitate to engage. If you are watching the live stream, I can't see your chats on YouTube. I can't possibly be in both, both places at once. So kick over to Zoom if you want to interact, but uh, feel free to just stay on YouTube and watch. And so with no further ado, Dr. Erga, over to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Pickerel, for inviting me back. Um, yes, so World Prevention Day is organized by the International Association for Suicide Prevention. That's the IASP you see in the corner there. And it's endorsed by the World Health Organization. It's a day of awareness and represents the global commitment to focus attention on suicide prevention. Connecting and speaking openly about suicide in the context of compassion, trust, and empathy is the only way that we as individuals and as a society can help end the stigma, enhance support, and encourage well-informed action. 
Okay, so last year marked the 18th year of Prevention Day and the final year of the previous theme working together to prevent suicide. To commemorate that, last year IASP released Step Closer. It's a short film that builds on the physical metaphor that every step closer can connect someone to life. And although this year introduces a new triennial theme, the fact has not changed that we all have a role to play in working together. So I'd like to take two minutes literally two minutes to watch the film together uh, since I have this captive audience. So I'm hopeful that this will work again. Deirdre, if you could just give me a thumbs up to, if it does work, oh no. I love technology, isn't that fun? <laughs> okay, it's not, okay. Did you, when you shared your screen, did you down at the bottom, it says to optimize video? I did, okay. Right. I'm sorry, everyone. See, this <laughs> happens to us as well. Okay, may, perhaps if I stop my share quickly and bring it up because I think I clicked the wrong button. Yeah, that would that would probably work if you bring it up separately. Okay. There we go. All right. See, this is this, this is what happens to um, uh, it happens to the best of us. Oh, Sura, it's lovely to have you here, honey. I'm so glad that you're you're here joining us tonight. Sarah is, is one of our students and she comes to so many events and is so very, very supportive. So it's great to have you here. Okay, I can see the play okay, button now. So we should be we're okay. back. Okay, sorry, okay. like you said, this happens to all of us. So if you're a student, you know how I feel. <laughs> here we go. A simple, smile. a simple smile could be little to you or I, but to someone thinking about suicide, it can be the first step towards life. Suicidal thoughts are complex. No one knows exactly what works to stop another tragedy, adding to the 800,000 suicides and 20 million attempted suicides a year. We do know, though, that certain actions can make a difference. And we know that if we put a wide range of these actions in place, we have a better chance of preventing suicides. Community support to counter the isolation so often found responsible and sensitive media portrayals to help people see how others have managed. Local education to create awareness of the community. Restricting the means of suicide to stop people at critical moments. All these actions have been shown through research to work. But we can't do all this alone. We need people on the ground to help us make the first step towards those with suicide by stepping closer, we can be aware of those around us who need help. By stepping closer, we can encourage those with suicidal thoughts to reach out. By stepping closer, we can support those in need by sitting in their pain. Every step closer can connect someone to life and the help they want. Sometimes those steps are big. Sometimes all it takes is a smile. So thank you for watching that with me. I love that film because I think it just really captures what Prevention Day is about and what we're striving to do to help change the narrative uh, around suicide. Uh, like I said earlier, this year introduces a new triennial theme, creating hope through action. And this, that theme aims to inspire confidence and light in all of us uh, and serves as a reminder that there is always an alternative to suicide. Creating hope through action reminds us that our actions, no matter how big or how small, can provide help, help and hope to those who are struggling. Preventing suicide is possible, even up to the very last moment, and each of us can play a key role in doing that. Whoops. Okay. So I'm attempting to cover a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. Um, and you'll see that my slides, I have a lot of slides and I have a lot of bullet points. But what I want you to know is that you don't have to furiously be trying to take down notes because our wonderful communications team has told me that they will make a copy of the presentation available to those who want it after the event. So uh, you can just sit back and, and listen and jot down any questions you have. But just know that when you do get a copy of the presentation, uh, most slides have a hyperlink 
So if you see some information or if you see an infographic that you like and that you want, you want to share with others or you want to research more, just click that hyperlink and it will take you directly to the source. Uh, and also rest assured that I'm going to do my best to let the slides speak for themselves and not elaborate on every single point, but rather just to limit my commentary to highlighting the, the key takeaways. And like uh, Dr. Pickerel said, you know, we really want this to be as interactive as possible. So while I do have this presentation uh, put together, we don't have to be formal or rigid about it. We can jump around. And also, because I know that some people are tuning in tonight, um, looking for answers, looking for suggestions for themselves, whether it's because they're struggling with thoughts about suicide or they're concerned about someone or they're bereaved um, from, the, from losing someone by suicide. I have included some slides that have some specific suggestions um, so that you have that there if you don't wanna click the hyperlinks, uh, but we may not, we probably won't go into a lot of detail uh, on those slides. I just want you to have them. Okay, so what are the facts? What do we know? So World Health estimates that over 700,000 people die by suicide globally each year. That means that breaks down to one person every 40 seconds. That is a staggering statistic. That equates to 2,160 deaths by suicide each day. One person dies by suicide every 40 seconds. That means that by the end of my talk tonight, it's estimated that 90 people will have died by suicide. Um, a couple of points that I wanna highlight on this slide are that for 2019, the age standardized suicide rate was 9.0 per 100,000. However, if you look at the differences between males and females, you'll see that globally, uh, the age standardized suicide rate is more than two times higher in males than in females. Another sobering statistic is that there's indication that for each adult who dies by suicide, there may be more than 20 others who attempted suicide. So those are just some of the basic uh, facts and figures from World Health. In terms of the statistics uh, in the Canadian context, um, at the top of the screen here, you'll see a couple of screen grabs from infographics put out by the Public Health Agency of Canada based on 2016 uh, statistics. At the bottom, you'll see the World Health 2019 most recent uh, estimates. So um, overall, the the global trends are mirrored in Canada with some key differences that I'll highlight. So the age standardized suicide rate in Canada is 10.3, which is slightly higher than the 9.0 rate that we see globally. Um, in Canada, we see that the suicide rate for males is estimated to be three times higher than the rate for females, which is a larger difference than we see globally. One other difference that I'll point out, and I don't think it's actually on this slide, uh, but you can get it by clicking on the hyperlink, is that whereas World Health reports suicide as the 17th leading cause of death worldwide, in Canada, it's reported as the ninth leading cause of death across all ages. When we look at the age groups, what we see is that suicide is the second leading cause of death for 10 to 29 year olds, the third leading cause for 30 to 44 year olds, the seventh leading cause for 45 to 64 year olds, and it's the 12th leading cause for those who are in the 65 plus age range. Now, before we continue on and, and address any questions that people might have about those rates, uh, and before we talk about what the impact of the pandemic has been on suicide rates, I think it's really important to take a moment to acknowledge that Yes, while it is critical that we know what the facts and figures are, we're not talking about dry facts and figures, hollow numbers. We're talking about people, real human suffering, real lives that have been lost, real devastation for those who are bereaved by suicide. And so what I've shared here is a screen grab of the Faces of Fortitude project. Uh, I was given permission by Mary Angela, who is the person that created this project. And she, uh, they created it as part of their own healing following their brother's suicide. So Faces of Fortitude is a movement that began as a series of portraits that documents the healing of those affected by suicide in, in, in any way. Uh, it provides a safe, stigma-free space, both virtually and in, and in person, for mental health and suicide to be discussed. So 
like I said, before I move on, I just hope that we all can connect with the faces that we see on the screen right now and really connect with the significance that is inside those facts and figures reported by Stats Canada, reported by World Health. Before we move on to answering this question of how the pandemic has impacted suicide rates, uh, Deirdre, I'll just pause and see if there's any key burning questions that people have or comments. <laughs> Even none, not have, even none, have, none have come in, but you know somebody might. Um, you know, please you. I can't unmute you. That's going to get too complicated. But please use the chat or the Q and A panel. But I, I have to say, like those numbers are scary, right? Like that's that's incredible. Then, the, the, like I don't, I don't know that people seem to. Um, I don't know that I would have realized that, and yet I asked you here to do the talk, and but those are incredibly no. high numbers. It's scary. It is scary. It is scary. And that's because, of course, we care. Um, and while they are scary, it's important to recognize that they are, and I don't mean this in any sort of cold way, yeah. but statistically speaking, suicide is still a rare event, statistically speaking. Right. And so we have to hold both of those things, right? We have to recognize that it is still a statistically rare event. And so we have to remember that when we talk about suicide so that we don't talk about it in a sensationalized way, in a way that induces fear and panic, like this tsunami that's coming that is, you know, uh, unavoidable or inevitable. Um, right. and, and actually the data that we're going to talk about in a little bit is going to speak to that, that suicide is not inevitable, not even during a pandemic of you know, unprecedented proportions. Um, at the same time that we recognize that it is a statistically rare event that is of no solace to anyone who is struggling with thoughts of suicide, who has lived through an attempt, who is trying to find a way back, or who is supporting someone who's struggling with suicide, or who is still grieving the loss of someone. So it's, you know, we need to hold both of those things, right? We can't become numb to those statistics, and we can't become um, a, like sensationalist about it either. Right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So a couple of questions have come in. One, uh, two are, are fairly similar. So one was, um, is there a higher rate of suicide in, in specifically in Indigenous communities? And But then the other question is similar in terms of, does the data identify any particular ethnic or socioeconomic group that is more at risk um, just aside from gender splits? Yeah, absolutely. So those are great questions. Um, and they're, you know, whoever asked them, you're definitely on the right track. And so the, the devil is always in the details, yeah. right? And so if you go in and you look at data that's stratified according to some of these uh, demographic uh, factors that, that were mentioned, you will see some differences. So I don't want to say, I would be misspeaking if I said that across all Indigenous groups, there is a higher rate of suicide, but there is data that that has shown consistently that in some groups, there is that elevated risk. Um, and we're gonna talk about risk factors a little bit later, but the, the takeaway from that discussion, uh, I'll just you know give it away right now, <laughs> is that is that it's, we can't, in, in talking about suicide and risk factors, we can't reduce it down to any algorithm or any specific right. formula. It is this complex interaction of dynamic risk factors um, precipitating events that then results in suicide. So right. those are risk factors, um, but as we'll talk about later, just simply carrying a risk factor or being a part of a group that has that has been shown statistically to have a, an elevated rate of suicide does not mean that one will attempt suicide, right. will experience thoughts of suicide. It just means that statistically speaking, and clinically, if you're work, if you're a mental health professional, it means that there is some elevated risk across time that we should be paying attention to. Right. Um, so I, some of these, they, they, I think we might get to some of these when we talk about risk factors. But um, a lot of our audience is very interested in the men, the, the men women thing, because that was a big gap, right? If men are, I think it was three times more likely, yeah. and and so are sure. women more 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 manage stress bad? Like, are they more tolerant? Like, is, is there anything that might give us a clue as to, you know, why this gap exists or why men are, are mm -hmm. more likely, I guess, for lack of a better word, you know, way to put it? To sure. Well, and again, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share some information, but the caution is always don't overgeneralize. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So that is a surprising, that, that statistic surprises a lot of people. Um, and even mental health professionals who are just getting started. And, and the, one of the reasons why it surprises a lot of people is because there is other research that shows that women are more likely to make an attempt, okay, to make an attempt at suicide. Uh, wow. However, men are more likely to choose methods that carry a higher lethality. So, uh, for example, research indicates that women are more likely to use a method like poisoning, whereas men you know, may use a method like uh, using a firearm. So the lethality is higher in using something like a firearm because it is just inherently more deadly. Yeah. Um, the ability to abort if you change your mind is very, you know, <laughs> limited. Um, it's so, so that is one reason why there is that gender difference is that, you know, although women are more likely to attempt men tend to choose methods that carry a higher lethality. Yeah, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. The, the other note that I made and one of our um, attendees has, has, uh, has commented on it too is how our language has changed. You know, it used to be, you know, somebody's committed suicide mm. and now we're, you're, we don't really hear that language anymore. Now it's more died by suicide. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think, so the, the question has been, which language do you suggest being used while working with, oh, while working with those who have attempted or know someone who has, who has um, mm -hmm. died by suicide? Yeah. Oh, I'm so impressed with our audience members. These yeah. are fantastic Aren't questions. Aren't they good? Yes. Yeah. So relevant. So yes, the language is changing. Uh, not everyone has changed the language, but it is that that shift in languaging is consistent with other um, shifts in language and, and talking about other clinical issues. And right. so using person first language, so not so avoiding language that defines somebody by their struggles or by their diagnoses or disorders is really important. Using language that is neutral. And so avoiding language that perpetuates any of the stigma or shame that goes that often goes along with suicide specifically, mental health generally, is why we're shifting, why we have shifted away from committed suicide to died by suicide. One committed can carry that stigma of you did something wrong. It's a sin, it's a moral weakness. Um, there are places in the world where suicide is still criminal. Yeah. And so that is a huge barrier in being able to talk openly about suicide, let alone reaching out and getting help for it. And right. so when you're working with somebody who has any type of lived experience with suicide, um, and, and I think this goes, I think this is a good sort of rule of thumb in working with people generally, is pay attention to the language you use and really make that effort to move away from language that could inadvertently perpetuate stigma, shame, anything like that, and shift towards that that neutral, unbiased language. Um, at the same time, you know, pay attention to how the person, what language they use. And it may not be necessary to, you know, correct them, but just listen to that and, and pay attention to what they might be communicating with their nonverbals as well. Um, but yes, I and actually uh, in the the last 10 pages or the last 10 slides of my presentation are just all resources, hyperlinked, everything. And one of the resources there is a link to language guidelines. So how can we talk about suicide safely, responsibly, in terms of reporting on it, uh, you know, whether that be the media, um, talking about it as a mental health professional, or sharing your own personal experience? So uh, yeah, so great question. Tune in to like, you know, the slide 59, I think, and you'll find a hyperlink there <laughs> where you can find out more. I, I think that, you know, and, and then we'll move on. There's, I've, I've missed a whole bunch of stuff in the chat, but when you're talking, I'll go back. But I, I think this is a, just a really good example of how, how language evolves and how powerful words are. I always remember that. Did you get this when you were growing up? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt, right? Like, I, I grew up with that, but you know, words hurt and they words do. have power and they, it makes a difference when our, you know, and so I think it's good that our language evolves it, and, absolutely. you know, we, we learn to say things differently in a, you know, whether it's a kinder or more neutral or, you know, whatever it might be. So it's absolutely it, um, yeah. language is powerful. And, you know, in terms of 
talking about suicide with compassion and hope, this is how we do it is by using yeah. language that is compassionate and, and, you know, devoid of that, in, that stigma, that shame, that, ooh, you know, um, it avoids that. And so it really can tear down those barriers that so many people experience in terms of talking openly about this and reaching out for help. Um, yeah, and it's not being politically correct, right? It's, <laughs> It's being a kind, compassionate, caring human um, yeah. who recognizes that common humanity that we all share. And yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's powerful. Okay, um, I'll get caught up on the okay. chat and, and um, we'll okay. let you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I'm loving this interactive piece. So like I said, I do have this whole kind of formal looking presentation, but don't, you know, let's, we don't have to worry about that. We can jump around. Like I said, a lot of the slides are self-explanatory. So I, would, I really enjoy this exchange. Okay, so how has the pandemic impacted suicide rates? I think people are going to be really surprised. I know that I was, and I know that everyone I've talked to about it in my personal life are surprised. Um, you know, we, more than ever, I think that mental health has been brought to the forefront of public discourse uh, and discussion. Um, you know, and multiple lines of evidence uh, indicate and affirm what I think so many of us have observed uh, or even experienced in our own personal lives in terms of responding to the pandemic and how it's impacted us. Uh, so, you know, the research has confirmed that the pandemic has had, the pandemic and the measures put in place to deal with the pandemic have had a profound psychological and social effect. Um, and these may lead to the development or exacerbation of mood, anxiety, and substance use disorders or, or other mental health uh, difficulties. Those in turn are risk factors that are associated with suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So it's understandable that many expressed concern and some experts even predicted that we would see an increase in suicide following the pandemic. Um, like I said, I'll give a spoiler alert. I think people are gonna be surprised at what the research has found. Um, but so the International COVID-19 Suicide Prevention Research Collaboration was established to monitor the global effect of COVID-19 on suicide. Uh, they've tracked studies specific to COVID-19 and suicide, and they found that most of the studies to date have some pretty significant methodological limitations. So, to address those limitations, the, this group, this collaboration did their own study uh, and the findings were just published in the July, 2021 issue of The Lancet Psychiatry. So um, <laughs> let me, uh, full disclosure, I am far from a statistician. My research days are pretty far behind me. So I do want to share this study with you guys, but I am going to try not to get mired down into the, the, the wonky nitty gritty of the statistics and instead just provide what is probably an oversimplified summary, but that's probably as much for me as it is for you. So this study sourced data from 21 countries. Um, those country, of, of those countries, 16 were classified as high income and five were classified as upper middle income. In order to address some of the methodological limitations of other studies, this study sourced data only from official government sources. Uh, and it's important to note that the, of the data that they have, 10 countries had data for the whole country, the entire country, and 11 had data for specific areas within the country. Okay, so what did they do with this data? And so again, if you want the nitty gritty details, and I, I, I really hope that you do, just click on the hyperlink and it will take you directly to this study where you can look at it. Uh, the researchers performed several analyses, but I'm only gonna talk about the primary analysis that they did. And the reason for that is one, time, and two, the findings of the other analyses by and large are consistent with the findings from the primary analysis. So what did they do? First, the researchers looked at data from the pre, from pre-pandemic era, uh, era. So they looked at the data from official government sources and they used some fancy statistical procedures to model the monthly trends in suicides for each country. Then, they compared the expected number of suicides derived from those statistical models with the observed number or reported number of suicides in the early months of the pandemic. 
So again, just a couple of things to emphasize the reported actual suicides uh, came from official government sources. And the period that they looked at uh, was the early months of the pandemic, which were defined as April 1st, 2020 to July 31st, 2020. So what did they find? Um, actually, it's what they did not find. So they found no statistical evidence of an increase in suicide during the early months of the pandemic in any of the countries or areas within the country. In some cases, actually in 12 countries, they found statistical evidence of a decrease in suicide, uh, including in Alberta and British Columbia. Um, Manitoba reported a decrease as well. Uh, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was approaching statistical significance. So as surprising as these findings are, they do align with those from other studies of, of high and upper middle income countries. So some cautions in terms of how we interpret these findings. Uh, again, it's important to note that the, this study, the countries included were of high and upper middle, were cla classified as high and upper middle income. So low and lower middle income countries, which account for 46% of the world's suicides were not represented. Another caution is that these are early findings and, and they may change. The pandemic is still ongoing and its impacts will likely be long lasting. Um, we also know uh, from the clinical literature that there can be a time lag in the manifestation of distress, uh, even months after the acuity of a traumatic or stressful period is over. Uh, a third caution is that there may be variations between demographic groups and geographical areas. And this goes, you know, this speaks to one of the questions that was asked a, a little while ago. Uh, this study was not able to stratify the data by age, sex, or ethnicity. And the pandemic might have a differential effect on suicides in certain demographic groups. Uh, we know that the impact of COVID-19 has not been uniform across all communities. And so the apparent stability and in some countries uh, apparent decrease in suicide rates as reported in this study may mask what's actually going on among subgroups that have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So more research is necessary. I know that this group, they are going to be doing more research and they will be looking at some of these questions. Um, and it will be important that uh, future studies explore those differences in demographic factors and that they also explore some of the social determinants such as income, access to health care, and stressors that marginalized communities may experience that might influence suicide patterns. So the question is likely more nuanced. It's not so much have suicide rates risen during the pandemic, but rather in whom, when, and where. So let me pause, Deirdre, because I imagine people are reacting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm you and I talked about this, right? And I we were I'm surprised because surprised. we know that 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 you know that we're hearing a lot of reports around mental health and anxiety on the rise. You know, the, the, yep. the pandemic has not been pleasant experience, and and so I think we expected to see that associated yep. with higher rates of of suicide, and that you know at least within this study, and that's. That's always the thing with studies, right? And statistics right. and playing around with numbers. But yeah, so in terms of the people that are commenting, our audience is a little bit surprised. And, you know, um, one one person said, I wonder if this is due to families being home together. Um, youth are not at high school. They're not experiencing bullies. They're not, yeah. you know, having those kinds of stressors. So in some cases, you know, COVID may have you know, ha having all your kids at home suddenly caused a new stressor, but it might have actually been a better environment for kids if they were experiencing bullying and, and trauma, at, you know, in school. So it's, it's almost like how it, it shifted potentially yeah. um, mental health concerns or anxiety as opposed to, you know, it was, we, as you said, we've all experienced COVID quite differently. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm just trying to catch up. So and we've had mm -hmm. some, so for, for those of you that are sharing your personal experiences, you know, we all really appreciate that. And, and um, you know, I, I, I said to one uh, participant that I, I actually think there's probably, that probably more of us have been impacted by suicide than we might realize. And because again, and, and you and I talked about this as well, I think probably when we were chatting before I opened the session that 
it's not something we seem to be allowed to talk about. It's the same as mental health, right? You don't you don't share that you have a a brother with you know um, who's schizophrenic or a, you know, like it's not. So, but you wouldn't you wouldn't hesitate to say my brother was recently diagnosed with cancer or has diabetes or whatever it might be. And so it's it's all part of this this bigger stigma and shame around so many of these things that impact our lives so severely that we just seem to not be allowed to talk about. Absolutely. And that's, you know, the whole point of Prevention Day is to break down that belief and that barrier and that myth that we're not allowed to talk about this or that we have to, you know, you know or like, that's so contrary to everything that the research tells us is that actually talking about it openly, talking about it directly, asking someone directly, you know, this is a really tough time. I know you've been going through something for quite a while now. How are you holding up? Have you ever thought about suicide? Have you ever thought about hurting yourself, harming yourself? Some being able to talk about it directly, it and and again doing so, balancing that willingness to talk about it directly with also that sensitivity that this is a difficult topic, you know. Okay. And so we talk about promoting compassion um, for people who are impacted by suicide in whatever way. Uh, it's also really important to you know, be compassionate with ourselves when we're kind of uncomfortable talking about it because it is hard because it is so important. It is literally yeah. a matter of life and death. And so you know, we have to avoid that avoidance. We have to move forward as opposed to standing back. Um, and, and so yes, that, that, and then in terms of the surprise that, these, you know, that we're all experiencing, <laughs> I think most of us, if not all of us, in terms of responding to the findings from this study, you know, again, some really insightful comments that everyone is impacted differently. Everyone's personal, you know, makeup of risk factors, protective factors, um, whatever shifts they've had to make in their personal life, work life, it's so individual. And so yeah. for some people, this has really, and you know, and I can think about a, a list of personal friends who really struggled during the pandemic and, and lockdown because they were not able to connect with others. Whereas some other people, it's like, okay, the whole family is together now and we're actually connecting in ways that we weren't connecting before. Um, we're all kind of this captive audience in the same house together. And, and so I, I think also, and maybe I'm just skip to my other slide here, is that, you know, in terms of, understanding this apparent non-change, it, it's a good reminder that we have to not just focus on the risk factors and these, you know, the precipitants and acute stressors, but we also really need to look at protective factors. Mm -hmm. What is that social safety net that we were bolstering and perhaps we weren't even realized we were bolstering? You know, if you think back to the early lockdown days, uh, you know, personally, I, I was like, visiting all of my neighbors from a distance, but checking in on my elderly neighbors. Do you need anything? How are you doing? Yeah. We're here. I have toilet paper. I have food. I'm going to check on you. I know your kids live far. They can't come see you right now. We're literally next door. I hate to admit it, but as the pandemic went on, that reaching out and checking in on my neighbors decreased, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I didn't even really realize that until I was preparing for tonight's talk and trying to understand, you know, these, these findings. And it's like that initial response, that collective, we're in this together, you know, kind of returning to what unites us as, as, as people, as, as global citizens, that I think really did exert an effect. This is just my, I, my thoughts. This, is, this hasn't been studied yet. But I think that if we can return to that, um, and maintain that beyond the pandemic. So that reaching out, connecting, perhaps being more alert to warning signs. Okay, that person's saying some things that I've never heard them say before. They're withdrawing in a way that like they won't even take my calls. They don't wanna attend our you know, Zoom get togethers. Being more alert to those changes, perhaps we were, that was heightened in the early days of the pandemic. And so again, it's really important that these studies continue to see if there are time differences as well. Right. But so, you know, other other factors to consider are, you know, and this is where it's going to be important to look at the different countries that are in the you know, lower and lower uh, income uh, categories is that what type of financial support 
initiatives uh, did governments offer or take that might have helped buffer the impact? What sort of mental health resources or you know um, social media campaigns were put out there that really helped connect people to uh, ideas and resources in terms of how they can take care of themselves and each other and how they can build and maintain resilience during the pandemic? Mm-hmm. So those are things that you know, I, I have to believe, and again, this is just me speaking from my heart. I don't know, the, but I don't think the research is out there yet, but I have to believe that that did make an, a difference. Yeah, and there's, uh, I totally agree. And and I can't keep up, holy smokes, <laughs> that popular talk. But there are a couple of things that I thought I would share. I, I think a couple of people have shared some really interesting things in the chat. And one of them was, you know, we're, we're, we're almost looking historically in terms of how COVID has potentially impacted increased mental health, impacted suicide rates and these interesting trends that we're seeing, but we haven't returned to work yet. And so we also aren't really sure um, what the pandemic, what going back to whatever normal looks like now, because I, I think it's going to be, we're not going back to what nor, what life was, we're going back to something new. And so how people are now going to, because it's gone on for so long, how to have to adjust to, you know, whatever it looks like now, if they're being required to go back to work, Absolutely. you know, kids going back to school, we as an institution are looking at back to campus. And that yeah. even feels strange because it's been so long since we've yeah. welcomed students at campus. What is that going to look like? Um, you know, there's comments in the chat and in the Q&A about the financial implications. Like some people didn't do badly financially for, um, you know, in terms of, of COVID. Others maybe did better. Now, whether they, they did better because of work or in some cases, better is not the nicest term, but we had served, right? So there was... Yeah. That we expanded the social safety net. And so though it wasn't a lot of money, there was a, you know, people that mm-hmm. would were even more disenfranchised might have had an opportunity to have serve and therefore be able to afford food or medicine that they wouldn't have been able to afford before. So, you know, it 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 it's almost like COVID just just kind of shifted how everybody's lives were, but not necessarily in the same direction. And so we didn't mm-hmm. have, we're not going to have the same response to it. And I think there's so much about COVID's impact on our lives that that we really just don't know at this point. Like, there's so much unknown. Exactly. And you know, it's funny, Deirdre, because when we were chatting before last year's presentation, we were having this exact discussion. Like, <laughs> what type of research is going to come out of this? What are we going to learn? Because the, the new norm, we're never going back to what we knew yeah. before. And yeah. again, how you know, we can model predictions, we can, you know, derive some ideas, but in terms of predicting with 100% accuracy how any given individual is going to respond, I mean, it's yeah. just impossible, right? Yeah. And so, you know, as you were talking, you know, I was, I couldn't help but think about a lot of um, clients and my students' clients and my supervisees' clients who are returning to work, not by their choice, but they're experiencing this surge of anxiety because yeah. anxiety that they didn't have before, but because you know they had to adapt to this you know unprecedented pandemic, and now they're go- and it's been so long nobody thought that we'd still be in it to this degree, and now they have to go back. And so for some people, a lot of people, there is this surge of anxiety and going back, and where which is contrary to what I think a lot of people would have predicted that, okay, going back, getting our lives back, going back to normal, a lot of people are looking forward to that, but it just, it means different things to different people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's okay. move on. Uh, there's, we'll, we'll try to get to questions, everybody, but we'll, we'll, like <laughs> well, and, and like I said, so I mean, listen, there yeah. is, you know, I'm looking at the time, we're already, wow, we're already at 7.43. <laughs> so uh, spoiler alert, we're not gonna get through every single slide, but like I said, I. I created the slides so that they can pretty much stand on their own. So yeah. people who are looking forward to that information, you will get it from our wonderful communications team. Um, we just may not engage in such stimulating conversation about each yeah. slide. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. So risks, factors, protective factors, and warning signs. Um, while no, I, I can't stress this enough, no single cause can explain or predict suicide. Um, that said, identifying and understanding risk and protective factors does play a critical role in suicide prevention. Uh, doing so provides us direction about what we need to pay attention to and what we can aim to change or strengthen, whether you are an individual in the general population, whether you're a mental health professional. Okay. 
so before I, I talk about this slide, one thing that I, I want to comment on is that warnings, risk factors and warning signs, even though they're often conflated and confused, they are two different things. They're not the same thing. Uh, and being able to tell the difference between a risk factor and a warning sign is important. Uh, a risk factor is something that indicates based on research that someone may be actuarial research. So that indicates that someone may be high, be at heightened risk for suicide at some point in time but they tell us little or nothing in terms about the immediate risk a person might be experiencing. Whereas warning signs are changes in behaviors, thoughts, um, moods that may indicate someone is at immediate risk of suicide. So talking about risk factors helps us understand what might need to change within an individual or in a community in order to decrease, decrease risk of suicide across time. Talking about warning signs helps us know what actions we can take right now to help someone who may be at immediate risk for suicide. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, let me just say that researchers have identified dozens um, and dozens of risk factors. On the one hand, I don't want to provide a long list of risk factors because not all risk factors are equal. Some carry more weight than others. Um, and if you have a long list of risk factors, then the major risk factors can get lost in that list. At the same time, I do think it is important for us to be aware of risk factors and what they are. Um, as, as a clinician and as a supervisor, there are so many times when I'm discussing a case with a student or supervisee and I'm asking about suicide risk and the person saying, oh, I." The per, you know, that the client never indicated that they were at risk or they were thinking about it. So I didn't do a screening. And my response is, okay, fair enough. And based on what I know about this person, just in terms of their demographic variables and their historical variables, my set, my antenna is going to be raised. I'm going to be sensitive to paying attention to any changes because statistically speaking, they are at heightened risk. That doesn't mean that they're gonna do something, but it just means that we need to be extra, pay extra attention should something change, should something unexpected happen, like a pandemic, like a major life transition, like a major loss. So here on this infographic are some of the major uh, risk factors for suicide. Um, in terms of just highlighting some of the, the most major uh, risk factors for suicide, uh, previous suicide attempt. This is the strong, by far, by far the strongest risk factor for suicide. Uh, there are studies that have found that those who have attempted suicide in the past were at 38 times greater risk for dying by suicide than those without a prior attempt. Mm. Substance abuse. Uh, studies have found that those who have had an alcohol use disorder were at six times greater risk for dying by suicide than those who did not. Uh, so, you know, even if someone is drinking and it's not at problematic levels, but it's increasing and they are not coping well in other ways. They don't have healthier outlets of coping. I'm gonna be paying attention to that because again, I know that this combination of a person's risk factors can elevate their risk. So that's just an example of some of the major uh, risk factors. Another one that I wanna highlight is mood disorders. Um, Again, the majority of people, some mood disorders, uh, major depression, bipolar, dysthymia, um, they often go un undiagnosed or untreated. And although the majority of people who do have depression do not die by suicide, having major depression does increase suicide risk compared to people without depression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and one final major risk factor I'll highlight is access to lethal means. And, you know, as we talked about earlier in response to someone's question, you know, by lethal, I mean inherent deadliness of the means, the ease of use, the accessibility of those means, the ability to abort, mid-attempt, um, and also the acceptability of the means by the person who is considering suicide. Um, Questions, Deirdre, comments, anything coming up that uh, is a burning question? I, I, I don't I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> There's studies being quoted and all sorts of stuff. So they're having a great chat in the chat. Okay. But for those people that are wondering about the PowerPoint, Dr. Urga has kindly agreed to share her PowerPoint. We don't normally do that with our Ask an Experts. We usually okay. just have the recording. Um, but because her PowerPoint has got so much incredible information and so many links, what we'll do is once we get it on, on from Dr. Urga, it will be sent to everybody that's registered. 
whether you want it or not, it's gonna, <laughs> everybody's going to get it. And if you don't want it, hit delete. And if you want it, there you go. That'll be the there easiest thing for the communications team. Absolutely. And then of course, if you want to see our show again, you can just watch us on YouTube. <laughs> Yes, and Carly um, from our communications team, she oh. has the coffee already, and so oh, she's, great. She's, yeah. she's ready to send it out. Uh, but one Perfect. last thing I want to highlight about risk factors is that uh, as mental health providers, we absolutely must move beyond simple risk assessment uh, or simple assessment of risk factors and really move toward the clinical management of risk, uh, understanding what are a person's underlying reasons for considering suicide. What strengths do they have that perhaps they're not um, tapping into? What can we do to, to bolster protective factors? I'll talk about that in a couple of slides, but we definitely have to move. It's not sufficient just to assess risk factors. We have to move towards that clinical management. And that's something that if you are struggling with thoughts of suicide, um, that's something that's a really good reason to connect with the mental health practitioner. And I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but just looking at the time, I, I don't know if I'll be able to get there. So let me just say it right now. Connecting with a mental health practitioner uh, or mental health professional, that is going to give you the opportunity to work in an ongoing manner to not just reduce your personal risk over time, but to build your resiliency and strengths over time. And, you know, helplines and crisis lines are available, use them, they are so helpful. Call them, they will do what they can to help you keep, stay safe in the immediate term, they will help connect you with resources to help keep you safe in the longer term. But it's not the same thing as accessing that ongoing support in the context of a therapeutic relationship with a mental health uh, practitioner. So uh, I just wanted to say that here in case I don't get to say it later. Okay, so warning signs, like I said, these are different from risk factors because these are changes in how a person thinks, how a person behaves, how they feel that may indicate they're at immediate risk uh, of suicide. So what I wanna say here in keeping it brief is that you know, some warning signs are quite obvious. Okay, if a person is talking about wanting to die, is looking online, researching methods on how they can, how could, how they can attempt suicide, how they can, what they can do, those are pretty obvious. There are other warning signs that are less obvious. Um, and so again, what you want to be paying attention to is changes changes in behavior. So for example, increased drinking um, or, or drug use, um, withdrawing, isolating, giving prized possessions away, saying goodbye, writing a letter, changes in thinking. Um, there's no way out. There's no option. This is the only way I'd be, I, my family would be better off if I were dead. Changes in mood, um, feeling anger, feeling self-hatred, feeling a combination of these things, feeling shame, uh, being, uh, and, and in some cases, and this is important, in some cases, even a change in mood in terms of a sudden and unexpected sense of relief that really can't be a, attributed to something. So you're looking for these changes that happen over a relatively short period of time. Uh, so that's the takeaway from this slide in terms of warning signs. Um, oh, one other thing I want to say about warning signs is that in terms of someone experiencing uh, an acute stressor, so a job loss, a relationship loss, a financial loss, uh, a life transition, uh, humiliation, public shaming, when you see those changes in thoughts, behavior, and mood, and it follows or was preceded by an acute stressor, what, something that we would call, a, 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 often referred to as a tipping point, you really want to pay attention and you wanna do more than pay attention. You want to ask, you want to, you know, in consistent with this year's theme or the next three years theme, you want to reach in. You want to let the person know that they can, that you've noticed a change, that you're concerned, that you want to help. Uh, so. Don't just pay attention, but actually take the time to reach in, to create that safe space for the person to share what they're going through. 
In terms of protective factors, these are factors that reduce the likelihood of suicidal behavior. Um, and then again, it can really help improve their resilience, develop that resilience over time. And so again, if I were just to highlight a couple in the interest of time, connection. Um, connection, connection, connection. That could be connection to loved ones, to family and friends. It could be connection to um, social institutions, community resources. It could be connection to faith. It could be connection to um, a helpline, a mental health uh, professional connection. There are other protective factors as well, of course. But again, if I were just to highlight one, I would say connection. And again, consistent with the themes and the uh, aspirations of World Prevention Day, we, each of us, can be that connection, can help cultivate that connection with and for someone who's struggling. Deirdre, I'll pause. I don't know if <laughs> I'll pause. I'm also <laughs> noticing we have five minutes. <laughs> I don't understand how that happened. I mean, it just, it, the time whizzed by. So um, we've had lots of people that have said thanks so much and, and all those sorts of things. And I, I want to give a shout out to, to Sura, who comes to all of these events. And um, because she has shared in the chat, the link to the Student Success Center, which actually has a, uh, outlines the mental health and wellness supports that are available to all of our York University and Toronto Film School students. There is a list of crisis lines in your regions and in your communities. There is access to one-on-one -on -one mental health support with a um, uh, one of our members of our counseling team. There's individual resources, there's downloadable resources, there's all sorts of stuff there. Um, and then of course the PowerPoint will come to you with lots of resources that, um, that Dr. Erga uh, will share. Um, there is a, um, a question, Dr. Erga, that's in the chat that, um, uh, just whether there are, if you're aware of any studies that explore cultures or communities with lower rates that do an analysis to identify what the differences may be that could then promote positive effect for those areas with higher numbers. Those, those studies must exist somewhere. Like somebody's doing research around this. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that they are. I can't sort of cite any or rattle any off right off the top of my head right now, but I am confident that if you have access to the YU library and you do a, a lit search or those, of those keywords, you will find you'll get, you'll fall into a beautiful rabbit hole of information, information. And this is what happens to me anyway. <laughs> so it is out there. You just have to log into the library and do that keyword uh, search. Yeah, there's, there, this is obviously a, a, a very heavily researched topic. There's lots of people that are, whether in mental health or not, that, that, that are interested in this kind of information often because we've been impacted by it. And um, you know, as I said earlier, I, I really don't think there's there's many people in the world whose lives have not been touched in some way, shape, or form by um, by suicide. We're getting lots of it should be longer. Can you believe this, everybody? We did this in 30 minutes last year. <laughs> you guys were kind to me. We did it more in like 45, and I spoke extra, extra, extra fast. So you guys were really nice to me last year. <laughs> and so we, you were like, okay, we better give her more time this we year. We better and, give her more time. So yeah. obvious. Obviously, we recognize that this is a, you know, this is a big topic. And this is a, it's such an important topic. And, um, you know, we, we could never give it enough time, I no. don't think. Um, but before Dr. Erg, I turn the floor back to you for one message. I think the message that I would like everybody to, to take away from this is that we need to talk about it. We, we, we need to talk about it. So whether it's, um, you know, asking somebody how they're doing, asking people outright, however it is, if we stay connected and be kind to each other and just, you know, be curious about how people are doing. Um, I think we avoid these conversations because it is difficult, even the lay person, and you don't have to be a therapist, you don't have to be a counselor or have any counseling training to ask somebody how they're doing and to help them get the resources that they need. And so I, I really hope that we all can um, do the work in our own communities, in our in our own lives, to create safe spaces to have these really really important conversations. Dr. Ogra, I'll give you the last the last. Thank word. you, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who tuned in and all your amazing questions and your interest. Um, you're making a difference by 
that enthusiasm, that willingness, that willingness to ask questions, that willingness to share, that's what this is all about. And so thank you. And I'm sorry we're, you know, we're, we're having to end, but the last message I guess I would leave is, is distilled on this slide. And this is consistent. This is actually from, directly from this year's theme and social media campaign from uh, IASP. These are the three pillars of action in terms of what can we do? You, know, you don't have to change the world. You don't have to change your community. You can, by encouraging understanding, by reaching in and being willing to sit with someone in their pain, by being willing to listen, not have the answers, but just listen and let them feel seen and heard and cared for by sharing experiences, you can change someone's world. You don't have to change the world. <laughs> I know I, have, I certainly haven't changed the world, but I definitely believe that by doing these things uh, and by engaging in some of the um, guidelines and suggestions that are shared in other slides, uh, if you want, look at be the one two, hashtag be the one two. Those give you five clear evidence supported actions you can take to help save a life. By doing those things, I know for sure I have changed my life. I have changed, I have impacted the lives of those around me um, simply by encouraging understanding, encouraging compassion and hope uh, and just asking. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to have the answers. You just need to be there. Uh, so these three pillars of action is what I would like to end on for tonight. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Agri. You're getting tons of kudos in the in the oh. chat. Like I, I'll send them to you. People are absolutely thrilled. Um, I can't believe how fast this went. Holy <laughs> smokes! Um, I'm absolutely thrilled. It was lovely to see you again, and I'm so grateful Likewise. that you so generously give of your time and your expertise and all of the incredible information that you've shared. And I know will be on your slides. Like I'm just so so grateful. Um, that you're so generous with your time and your expertise to our York University community. Thank you so much. I, it, you. It's, it's hard because if I ask you again, then, you know, like I know you'll say yes, but I, I try. I try to spread it out in terms of, of who our speakers are. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for coming. Uh, please give communications a couple of days. Don't bombard them with, with emails. If they are coming. Uh, they will come, the PowerPoint slides. And um, in the... Uh, uh, words of my public health officer out here in British Columbia, what, what Dr. Bonnie Henry always says, and so what I always, the message I always try to pass on is please be kind to each other. We will get through it. Um, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Enjoy the rest of your week. Be well, everybody. And we will see you next time in October. This is, we're only doing one a month. So we'll, we'll see you in October. I don't even know what we're going to do. It'll be great. <laughs> um, um, we'll see you then. Take care all. Bye.